Hey everyone, you're watching Gamer Brain, and let's look at four delayed games that were almost never released. Number 4. Galleon You might not be familiar with the title Galleon, and you might not be familiar with the name Toby Guard, but you probably are familiar with his first commercial success, Tomb Raider. Galleon is the follow-up project that Toby worked on immediately after he left Core Design in a fit of anger, and it's definitely a story worth telling. In 1994, Toby was hard at work developing the first Tomb Raider game for PlayStation 1. He handled the full-motion video sequences, co-wrote the story, and even coded two of the levels all by himself. In fact, the famous mansion area that wowed gamers in 1996 was developed solely by Tony over the course of a single weekend when the team was in a real hurry. Most importantly, he is the person responsible for creating the Lara Croft character. This is also where all of his troubles would begin. Most development issues stem from problematic glitches or hard-to-reach deadlines, but Toby's beef with his team at Core Design and with the game's publisher at Eidos Studios was much more personal than that. You see, before Lara Croft became the world's first digitized sex symbol, she was originally intended to look much more innocent. That's because Toby had based Lara Croft on none other than his very own sister. So when the big wigs at IDOS started dressing her in skimpy clothing and increased her chest polygons by 150% without asking for his permission, he took serious offense. Toby stuck around until he just couldn't stand it anymore. In 1997, he left at the height of his career to form his own development studio called Confounding Factor with Paul Douglas, another ex-member of the core design team. Together, they would struggle with Galleon for the next seven years. Toby was 24 at the time. As the name suggests, Galleon is a swashbuckling action-adventure game that its makers describe as a mix between Sinbad and old kung fu films. Unlike Tomb Raider, the main character of this game is a male hero by the name of Captain Rama Sabria. The over-the-shoulder point of view and overarching exploration theme was, in essence, the same formula that made Tomb Raider so great. As such, it looked like Toby had created another slam-dunk game that would make Eidos sorry. Toby announced that the game was one year away from completion in a 1998 video with Gama Sutra, and everything seemed to be all set. However, there was just one major problem. While Toby had no shortage of determination, he did have a severe lack of manpower. Galleon was being developed by little more than a five-person bare-bones crew. As such, it was supposed to be released for the original PlayStation, but after that release date steered them by, it was supposed to be released for the Dreamcast, GameCube, PS2 and PC. Unfortunately, technical problems stopped them each time. When the game was finally playable, so much time had passed that the graphics were horribly out of date and the gameplay felt clunky. Toby and his team continued to slave away at an updated version of Galleon that they hoped would be able to compete with the next-gen titles, but as the years piled on, an actual release seemed less and less likely. Finally, a United Kingdom game publisher named Psy picked up the license in mid-2003. They announced that it would be an Xbox exclusive, which would severely limit the audience and therefore the sales, but at this point, Confounding Factor just needed to get the darn thing out there already. Unfortunately, the game's 2004 release was met with a relatively lukewarm reception. The game would have been seriously impressive in the 90s, but too much time had passed and there were already way better titles out there. Toby admitted defeat and rejoined IDOS that same year with Crystal Dynamics Studios, where he stayed until 2009. After that, Toby began a new development studio called Tan Gentleman five years ago. Now they are working on a PS4 virtual reality horror game called Here They Lie. Whether this new title will be a Tomb Raider or just another Galleon in terms of its success, however, remains yet to be seen. Number 3. Halo Combat Evolved If Halo was released in its original form, then you would have been clicking on bases instead of racking up headshots. 
That's because the series was originally supposed to be a top-down real-time strategy game, or RTS for short. At the time, the developers at Bungie were looking to capitalize on the success of their medieval fantasy RTS game, Myth. They partnered with Take-Two Interactive, who were the same guys who made Grand Theft Auto for the original PlayStation, and started developing what would eventually become Halo, one of the most popular series in gaming history to almost never see the light of day. The early versions of Halo took place on a planet called Solipsis. It was going to be developed for Mac computers only, and it wasn't even called Halo yet. Instead, the RTS was originally called the Crystal Palace, Hard Vacuum, Star Maker, Star Shield, and even the Santa Machine. Eventually, they decided to ditch the RTS concept entirely and move it one gigantic step closer to becoming the game that we all know and love. This time around, the gameplay was changed to a third-person shooter, and the setting was switched to a huge starbase that was built around a planet. This 1998 version featured rideable dinosaur mounts, harpoon weapons, a gravity gun, and they even planned to add sea monsters. Its codename? Monkey Nuts. No, I'm not making that up. Later on, lead developer Jason Jones changed the codename to Blam out of respect for his mother. Steve Jobs himself debuted an early version of Halo under its official name the next year at Macworld 99. The crowd loved it, and Bungie agreed to release Halo on the PC as well as the Mac. By the year 2000, however, plans would change yet again. Now Microsoft wanted Bungie to release Monkey Nuts, I mean Halo, exclusively on the Xbox instead. The only problem was that Take-Two Interactive had a say in the project too, and they didn't want to alienate their PC and Mac fanbase with an Xbox release. To get around this potential snag, Microsoft bought out Bungie and gave Take-Two Interactive all of the rights to the Myth series to do with as they pleased. Critics largely regarded this as a sellout move and were sad to see Bungie get eaten by Bill Gates. Even though the move was not well received by the public at the time, the split actually led to success on both sides. Take-Two Interactive went on to release a couple more Myth games, along with a little PlayStation 2 game called Grand Theft Auto 3. Microsoft, meanwhile, moved forward with their Xbox release of Halo. You would think that Halo would finally get released at this point, but no, not quite yet. Microsoft thought that the third-person view worked well for the campaign mode, but as far as multiplayer was concerned, well, the camera angles just plain sucked. Jason Jones initially protested this decision and delayed the game further, but he finally gave in and went ahead with Microsoft's demands. In 2001, after three redesigns and a development period that had begun sometime in the mid-90s, Halo Combat Evolved rocked audiences everywhere. Even though it was a launch title, it continued to sell more copies than any other Xbox game for the next four years. Years later, Halo Wars was released on the Xbox 360 in 2009. This title gives gamers a glimpse of what the original Halo could have been like if it were released as an RTS. Although Halo Wars has been widely regarded as a fairly decent game, most would agree that the decision to go first-person shooter was way better for the franchise. Number 2. Half-Life 2 Half-Life 2 was undeniably one of the most hotly anticipated games of the early 2000s. Valve announced Half-Life 2 in May of 2003 and said that the game would be out only four months later. However, one month before its release, a 21-year-old hacker stole the source code. The hacker was named Axel Jembe. He lived in Germany and he was extremely skilled at generating fake keys to install pirated games, as well as programming malware. Like many others, his favourite game of all was Half-Life. He was thirsty for any details he could get about the sequel, so he decided to hack Valve's servers. To do this, Axel used a program that's normally designed to synchronise files across multiple servers. Basically, developers will use this tool to make sure that their game files stay constantly updated as they work on them from different computers and locations. 
Axel, however, was able to use this tool to look up the names of all the subdomains in Valve's web directory. Most of these subdomains were well protected, but one subdomain owned by a company called Tangis was not blocked by Valve's firewall. Axel used this to access Valve's primary domain controller, which he found out had a generic username and no password. Now he had access to each and every one of Valve's servers. Axel spent weeks silently spying on design documents and other notes from Half-Life 2's creators. It was exactly the kind of inside information that he was looking for. Then he found the mother load, the game's raw source code. Axel quickly downloaded it and disconnected before anyone could notice. The young hacker was hoping to get the game to run on his computer, but it wouldn't work. Even after he hacked the code to make it run in a more basic mode, it just wasn't fun enough. He says that he got bored and shared the code with a close friend, and that this person was the one responsible for putting it on the internet. Whether or not this is true is anyone's guess. Either way, the director of Valve, Gabe Newell, took this opportunity to officially announce the delay of Half-Life 2. He blamed the source code leak at the time, but he later said in a 2004 interview with Games Fusion that the team had simply underestimated the amount of work that they had left to do. The game was eventually released way later than they had intended, in November of 2004. Anyway, Axel probably would have gotten away with all this if he didn't decide to foolishly email Gabe Newell directly on February 15, 2001. Just one day after Valentine's Day, Gabe received an email from someone who identified themselves only as the guy. Axel apologized for stealing the code and brazenly asked for a job working with Valve. Gabe didn't believe that it was real until he saw two attached files that could have only been taken from someone with access to his private servers. Gabe wrote an email back to Axel just a few days later. Of course, we would love to interview you for the job, the email explained. Are you available for a phone interview? Of course, Gabe had no intention of actually hiring him. Instead, the FBI was listening in as Axel bragged and admitted his guilt. They set up an interview to meet in person, but German authorities intervened before that could happen. Later that same week, a German police officer took Axel to the station. After explaining what had happened, Axel signed an agreement that he would check in with the police at least three times a week for three years until his trial date in 2006. At his trial, which only lasted seven hours and was on German soil, he was sentenced to two years of probation. While Axel did fully admit to hacking Valve servers, no one could prove that he was the one who had directly leaked the source code. Apparently, however, these were not the only illegal activities that Alex was engaged in. When he wasn't busy hacking Half-Life 2, Axel was hired that very same year to hack into multiple businesses and cause hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage. He was caught and charged for this crime in 2008. He might not have gotten in much trouble for stealing the source code for Half-Life 2, but if he is convicted this time, he could face 15 years. Number 1. Duke Nukem Forever We'll spare you the overused jokes and get straight to the meat of the story. In April of 1997, Duke Nukem Forever was announced by 3D Realms. It had been in development since 1996, just one year after Duke Nukem 3D. Originally, the game was scheduled to hit stores in January 1998, but in reality, it would be 15 years before the title would ever surface. To put this into a better perspective, a game that was originally designed using the Quake 2 engine took until the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 era to be released. What happened? Well, basically one blunder after another. It was originally supposed to be a side-scroller, but this idea was abandoned when the lead developer decided to work on a Duke Nukem 3D expansion instead, so it was back to the drawing board. In 1998, the new project lead, Dave Brussard, ditches the Quake 2 engine in favour of the newer Unreal Engine. The game gets bounced around a bit until a 1999 release is finally announced in August. 
When 1999 rolls around, however, lead developers announce that they are switching to a slightly modified engine that is for Unreal Tournament. This proves to be a terrible mistake. By November of that year, they admit that they have totally broken their own code and need to patch it. Whoops. At the end of 1999, some business exchanges take place and a company called Infogames buys a controlling stake in GT Interactive, a major video game distributor. They effectively own the Duke Nukem Forever project and schedule a new release for the year 2000. When 2000 rolls around though, Take-Two Interactive purchases the exclusive publishing rights. The game gets pushed back another year, but they do release a trailer at E3 that's very well received. From there, the divide between Brussard and Take-Two Interactive seems to widen. In 2002, Duke Nukem Forever is mostly scrapped in favour of yet another engine. A majority of the levels and character models are thrown away too. Delay after delay is announced, and Take-Two Interactive throws more money at the problem by expanding the team to 30 members. Things finally come to a boil on May 29, 2003, when Brussard writes a terse message that says, Take-Two needs to STFU IMO about the game's release. This is enough to make news on CNN and causes a lot of embarrassment on both sides. The bad publicity is further heightened when take 2 CEO says that the game is going to use Doom 3 technology. Dave Brussard denies this statement, and it becomes apparent that either no one knows what they are talking about, or something has gone terribly wrong and is now being covered up. Little more is heard from the development team for three more years. In 2006, Dave announces that the game is mostly complete. Little news circulates for another two years, until in 2008, when it's finally scheduled for the PC, Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. After this announcement, 3D Realms promptly blows all of their money and shuts down in 2009. Thanks for being fans and for all your support, is all the message on their website says. There's also a lame group photo of them smiling. Apparently, they were full of hot air about Duke Nukem Forever the entire time. Take-Two Interactive sues 3D Realms for not developing the game as promised. They reach an agreement out of court, the details of which have never gone public. In 2010, Gearbox Studios acquires the license and announces that they will push Duke Nukem 3D through their distributor, 2K Games. At this point, there had been so many false starts that the world hardly cared about Duke Nukem anymore. Most of Duke's fans had gone through puberty and started families of their own. Now they had full-time adult responsibilities and very little time to kick ass and chew bubblegum, as the saying goes. Still, Gearbox Studios stayed true to their word and the game was finally released in 2011. And guess what? It stunk. Badly. But the legal fun doesn't end with Duke Nukem Forever. In 2014, Take-Two Interactive sued 3D Realms and another company called Interceptor for trying to develop yet another Duke Nukem game without their permission. Duke Nukem Mass Destruction was a top-down RPG that would have been released for the PC and PS4. 3D Realms replaced Duke Nukem with another character named Shelley Bombshell Harrison. Given 3D Realms' track record, however, the lawsuit probably wasn't necessary, since the game most likely would have taken another 100 years to make. Thanks for checking out this video. Since you watched the whole thing, I'd really appreciate it if you hit that like button. Subscribe as well if you want, since we upload a new gaming countdown each week.